Um, well, when I was preparing this talk, I thought I would give a little bit of a biography of the, of the Phoenix. We've heard about the Phoenix quite a lot this week, but we, it's a kind of misty being. So I decided to go up a, a mountain to find a holy man who would tell me something about the Phoenix. I climbed up this mountain through all its snow, its ice. It was a terrible journey. I got to the top and there was the holy man sat meditating. I said to him, please, sir, could you tell me about the, about the Phoenix? And he opened his eyes, he said, I know absolutely nothing. Why don't you just Google it? <laughs> so th th that is, that's what I did. <laughs> so that's what I did. I Googled it. So in Greek mythology, a phoenix is a long-lived bird that is cyclically regenerated or reborn. Associated with the sun, a phoenix obtains new life by arising from the ashes of its predecessor. In the historical records, the phoenix could symbolize renewal in general, as well as the sun, time, empire, metempsychosis or reincarnation, consecration, resurrection, life in the heavenly paradise in a Christian sense, Christ, Mary, virginity, the exceptional man, and certain aspects of Christian life. Now, uh, the Roman poet Ovid wrote the following about the phoenix. Beings spring from other individuals, but there's a certain kind which reproduces itself. The Assyrians call it the phoenix. It does not live on fruit or flowers, but on frankincense and odoriferous gums. Lucky thing, yeah, yeah. When it has lived 500 years, it builds itself a nest in the branches of an oak or on the top of a palm tree. In this, it collects cinnamon and spikenard and myrrh, and of these materials builds a pile on which it deposits itself and dying, breathes out its last breath amidst odours. From the body of the parent bird, a young phoenix issues forth, destined to live as long a life as its predecessor. When this has grown up and gained sufficient strength, it lifts its nest from the tree, its own cradle and its parent sepulchre, and carries it to the city of Heliopolis in Egypt and deposits it in the temple of the sun. And that's what Ovid says about the, um, the phoenix. And finally, these are a few words from Voltaire, another famous writer. He says it was the size of an eagle, but, but this is very important. Its eyes were as mild and tender as those of the eagle are fierce and threatening. That's something we don't know. It had mild and tender eyes. Its beak was the colour of a rose and seemed to resemble in some measure the beautiful mouth of Formosante. Now I've, never, I've not been able to find out who Formosante is, but she sounds very nice. Um, its neck resembled all the colours of the rainbow, but more brilliant and lively. A thousand shades of gold glistened in its plumage. Its feet seemed a mixture of purple and silver and the tale of those beautiful birds which afterwards fixed to the car of Juno. They did not come near the beauty of its tail. So we've learned a little bit more about the, um, about the phoenix. So why do we refer to the spiritual regeneration as the phoenix arising from the flames? Well, the rising from the ashes certainly hints at the cyclic nature of the manifested universe and all within it. We in theosophy are well acquainted with the rounds and races and the manvantaras and the periods of rest or pralayas in between. So in one sense, the phoenix rising from the flames may refer to this reawakening after a period of rest. The flames referring to the various levels of so-called destruction that comes at the end of certain periods of time. That is not really destruction, but the breaking up of the old to make room for the new. So writing about one of the highest stages of spiritual development, the theosophical writer Bhavani Shankar, he was an early member of the society, 
And he says, the result of this last struggle, that is success or defeat in it, entirely depends upon the latent energy of the jivatma, which is the individual spiritual entity, if you like, resulting from devotion to Ishvara. And Ishvara, I think, is the essence of all the spiritual intelligences in the, in this, on, this, on this earth. It's previous training and past karma. It is the real Kurukshetra, Kurukshetra being the battleground where the Kurus and the Pandavas fought in the Bhagavad Gita. The Kurus representing the, the uh, lower aspects of our nature and the Pandavas the higher. Where it, where it hears in full the song of life. And that's a very beautiful expression from the light on the path, the song of life. Life is a song, it's beautiful, it's music. It hears in full the song of life, Mahash Mashana. That's a very in interesting word, Mahash Mashana, the great burning ground. Uh, where it hears the voice of the cosmic deep and where Ahamkara, or the feeling of Ainus, is reduced to ashes. It is Mahasmashana, if that's how you pronounce it, I think it is. Because it is death of the individual man from whose ashes the regenerated man springs into existence, electrified, and we're talking a lot about Fuat recently, by the song of life. Isn't it nice to be electrified by the song of life? Not electrocuted, but electrified. It's lovely, it's beautiful. Now, a Chinese Buddhist master once asked, if the bird escapes from the net, on what does it feed? If the bird escapes from the net, on what does it feed? So I'm going to give what I think is an interpretation of that. If a Zen master was here, he'd probably say, no, no, that's not it. Don't intellectualize. But I don't think there are any Zen masters here. Not as far as I know. <laughs> if anyone who rushes to the front, I know that. Uh, um, this seems to mean that if we escape our constricting thoughts and emotions that hold us back, as if we were caught in a net, then what does the liberated soul feed upon? Well, it feeds upon spiritual experiences. That's the real soul food. And we grow into the light as a result of taking our sustenance from the spirit. We quaff the nectar of immortality. We may be said to feed on divine light, to feed upon divine light. The Bhagavad Gita, Judge's translation says, as the natural fire, O Arjuna, reduceth fuel to ashes, so does the fire of knowledge reduce all actions to ashes. There is no purifier in this world to be compared to spiritual knowledge. And he who is perfected in devotion findeth spiritual knowledge springing up spontaneously in himself in the progress of time. So what a beautiful paragraph that is. So true spiritual knowledge reduces all the actions that trap us in the self-made net of our cloying emotions and thoughts to ashes so that we can fly free like the bird in the endless skies of spontaneous spiritual experience. We rise like the phoenix from the flames of our limitations and our former existence. And the flames may also refer to the suffering that we go through on our quest, on our journey, on our pilgrimage together. And this suffering helps us to understand the suffering of others. It helps us to become compassionate and loving towards others. If the flames don't consume us, which unfortunately sometimes they do, it's, it's possible. Then we develop compassion and love, which may be why the phoenix's eyes are said to be mild and tender, because it's suffered. It may not be that, but that's the way I look at it because it's suffered and it's become mild and tender through the, through, the, through the suffering, through the flames. It's giving it this mildness, this tenderness, this love in its heart. So we emerge not only purified, but of what, aware of what it means to be alive in the true sense of the word. Not just the illusion of life that we usually live under, but the fact that there is no end to it to life. H.P. Blavatsky states in the Theosophy that we go 
from strength to strength, from the beauty and perfection of one plane to the greater beauty and perfection of another, with accessions of new glory, of fresh knowledge and power in each cycle. Such is the destiny of every ego, which thus becomes its own savior in each world and incarnation, its own savior. And in the, in the secret doctrine, it says that we proceed by self-induced and self-devised efforts. Self-induced and self-devised efforts. The path is one for all, but the, the means to reach the goal must vary with the pilgrim, as it says in the voice of the silence. So it seems that we are constantly arising from the flames to reinvent ourselves on a higher level. There's an old saying, whom, that, whom the gods would destroy, first they make mad. So I think they're trying to destroy me somehow, I don't know. <laughs> but um, oh, is, it, is it Nietzsche that said that? I think it's something. Um, and I've got, an, I've got a saying that people who've listened to my talks will have heard loads of times. It's my catchphrase. Every, every day I become more and more like Bruce Forsyth. I have catchphrases. And uh, this catchphrase is by Plato, and it's, heaven sent madness is preferable to man-made sanity. Heaven sent madness is preferable to man-made sanity because sanity is man-made. The, the governments, the education system tell us how we must act and to be regarded as being sane. If we act differently, we'll be regarded as insane. Um, people who are in, 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 in influenced or inspired by divinity or, divi or divine feelings and, 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 and uh, inspirations are regarded often as being mad, crazy. So, um, it, it, so you know, but it's, it, it, it's not. It's actually total sanity. It's actually the real sanity. It's like Shiva, who is um, exoterically regarded as, as the destroyer, but is the regenerator. He regenerates, also on a higher level. And I got this um, that the the saying that whom the gods will destroy first they make mad, from um, a Longfellow's poem, The Mask of Pandora. Uh, makes this even more interesting, as Prometheus is the one who gives the fire of intelligence to man, representing the divine beings that first awoke true reason and mind in man eons ago. So it makes it even more interesting. I don't know whether the Longfellow actually had that idea behind it when he did the poem, but it's, it, it seems to fit in. But let's return to Shiva for a while. Shiva represents a power that we all have within us to regener regenerate ourselves spiritually, as above, so below. We all have the power within us of Shiva. We have the power of, of Brahma to create or to initiate something in our lives. We have the power of Vishnu to preserve what we've initiated in our lives as long as we feel it's necessary. And we have the power of Shiva to destroy, to destroy it, to disintegrate it when needed and regenerate ourselves on a different or a higher level. We all have these, this power within us. Um, it's not just something that's very furry and, and, and philosophical. Now, Shin Buddhism, I go to Shin Buddhism now, relies on chanting the name of Amitabha Buddha, Namu Amida Butsu, which is a, an invocation to the Buddha of infinite light. It has the teachings of other power, Chiriki, Chiriki, and self power, Jiriki. Exoterically, it seems to suggest that we cannot be saved by our own efforts, but need to rely on Amitabha Buddha to rescue us. But D.T. Suzuki, who many of you may know, in his book, The Buddha of Infinite Light, shows that Amitabha, in this sense, is actually our own higher nature. It appears to us to be other power because it's beyond the reasoning of our, of our lower mind. So it appears to be something else that's, that's bringing about the results but it's actually not, it's actually our own higher nature. And self-power self -power is equated with the lower aspects of our will, which tries to solve spiritual problems by the use of the lower mind, which is an impossibility. We have to learn to trust our intuitions and the higher aspects of our being, beyond our senses and our lower reason. This then may be regarded as other power, Eventually, we have to give ourselves over to it, and it will appear to be other power to our limited senses and perceptions. 
but it is in fact the use of a power that transcends our ordinary understanding. I don't usually say personal things, but when I was in the 80s, I did have a, a, a breakdown and I lost the power to speak or to think. I was in hospital and they, I was given ECT several times and they could not bring me round. But something saved me. Something came, and I, I don't know what it was. Something gave me the energy and the strength to overcome uh, this thing. And I could not use self-power. I had no self-power. It must have been other power. And it gave me a deeper understanding of spirituality, a deeper understanding of the power that we have within us. I know I sound a bit like one of these evangelical people who go to meetings and say, <laughs> but, it, it, but it, it gave me this, I, I became aware of the reality of the power of the inner self, not just something that was in a book, that I'd read in books, something that was real and, and, and meant something. And that, was, and that was a great awakening for me. I mean, sometimes the mind may create an intermediary for this help, which may take the form of Jesus, Krishna, Kuan Yin, or Amitabha. And people are, are much more at home when they kind of um, feel they have some, some concrete thing that is doing the, the saving. So in one sense, this intermediary may be regarded as an illusion, but in another sense, as the vehicle of a higher power, it may be said to be just as real as the, as the illusions that surround us day to day in our, in, our, in our lives. So it's another mystery, really. And I think we, we must have mysteries. Otherwise, life would be rather boring, wouldn't it? And there's a fascinating story in the caves and jungles of Hindustan by H.P. Blavatsky about a, a government official called Mr. Peters. Now, Mr. Peters went to the city of Madura, as it was called then, in India. And he became fascinated with the goddess Minakshi, who was the patron goddess of, of that particular town. He became a great devotee of the goddess. And one night she appeared to him in a dream and said, get up, Mr. Peters, you're in great danger. If you don't get up now, you'll, you'll die. And he awoke and the house was on fire. It was burning. And, he, and also, he'd, somehow he was dressed. I can't explain that. Ask me to explain who dressed him or how he was dressed. Maybe he did it himself subconsciously. Um, but it illustrates what I've been saying. His devotion to the goddess, or the power that she represents, uh, probably activated his own higher self to protect him. <coughs> or is there another mystery behind all of this? Minakshi is one of the benevolent forms of Kali. And I like Kali, actually. You know, she's a, she gets bad press, Kali, but she's quite... <laughs> she's OK. Um, uh, she, but she looks very ferocious and very angry. But it's actually a beneficent, a beneficent force that destroys evil propensities in her devotees and also shows us how to get beyond preconceptions of what a spiritual being is. We tend to think of um, you know, spiritual people as being lovely in white robes and flowing hair. And, well, it isn't always true. I mean, HPB was a, an example that she was not what people would regard of as being a traditional spiritual teacher, but she, I think she probably had the same message. Um, Kali is the consort of Shiva, <coughs> his active energy or Shakti, and in one of her aspects is known as Shmashan Kali. Remember what we mentioned Mahasmashan some time ago? Smashan is a Hindu crema crema cremation ground. Crematorium, yeah. And in this sense, Kali seems to be the power that we mentioned to regenerate ourselves from the flames which burn away all in us that leads us towards death, to leave the immortal part of us fully awakened. We are much more than we think. In fact, we cannot think what we really are because it's beyond thought. There's a power within us that helps us. W.Q. Judge says that the higher self is our friend if we will but, we will but accept that friendship if we will but accept that friendship. It may appear to the personality to, to be something external, but it, it is this higher self. It's very real, it's a very real power. It's something, if we, if we are theosophists and stu or students of theosophy, and we are st studying these teachings, we must be aware that they're real, that, that this power within us is real. It's real, it, it really is. It's something that we need to, 
to understand and, 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 and to try and live by. The more that we become aware of it, the more that becomes, it becomes manifest in us. But it, it is always beyond the range and reach of thought. And it's something we need to have enlightened faith in. Enlightened faith. We cannot activate its power by using thought. Thinking of what is beyond thought is still thinking. Therefore limiting and rendering, rendering us unable to get beyond the precincts of conceptual views. There are two kinds of knowledge. That which is second hand and actually helps to increase the hold of the lower mind in the end as it feeds only the lower aspects of our being. And the second kind of knowledge is that which is a, as a result of direct experience and is the only one that is of any real use in the final analysis. I'm not saying that intellectual knowledge isn't useful or even essential up to a certain level, but there must be a, a point where, we, where we, 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 can, we leap beyond that, we go beyond that. There are also two kinds of faith. Blind faith based upon what we are told as a result of religious tradition and enlightened faith which comes as a result uh, under uh, an enlightened faith which comes as a result of gaining true experiential knowledge which brings in the operation of other power as mentioned earlier it is essential to realize that we are spiritual beings i know nowadays they tend to say spiritual beings on a human journey rather than human beings on a spiritual journey so we are we are spiritual beings we are limited only by the misconceptions or misunderstanding of what we are. And one of the main things about theosophy <coughs> is it tries to <coughs> alleviate or eliminate <coughs> some of these um, misconceptions in the teachings and the secret doctrine and try to, sh try to show us what we really are. What is our place in nature? Uh, you know, what kind of beings we really are I inwardly, so on different levels of our being, etc. Um, and the main idea to be gotten from our theosophical studies is the fact that the race of man is divine. Another um, of my favorite sayings is by Pythagoras. Take heart for the race of man is divine. Take heart for the race of man is divine. What's better than that? You know, take, take heart. No matter what happens, uh, I could become disillusioned with people, with humanity. Take heart for the race of man is divine. And another of my, my favorite things is uh, from the Lotus Sutra. <coughs> there's, there's a character called the Bodhisattva Never Despise who is my, um, one of my gurus. <laughs> and the Bodhisattva never, never despised, lived in a time when Buddhism was very much in, in decline and the, the Buddhist mon monks and nuns were living dissolute lives. And he tried to preach true Buddhism. And, but he was constantly being mocked and harassed. He was even beaten up, knocked to the ground. But he would always get up, he would never be angry. He would look them in the, straight in the eyes and say, I will never despise you because you will all be Buddhas one day. So what a wonderful thing. You know, he saw the divine in, in, in people. I will never despise you because you will all be Buddhas one day. So all, all the great beings have come to tell us exactly th that, that we are divine beings, and to give us pointers to realizing it. But in most cases, their followers often unable to fully understand what was being said, allowed the lower intellectual mind to overcomplicate what was said. And so volumes upon volumes of books were written, more often obscuring what was said, rather than clarifying it, and full of rules and regulations and ideas from people mainly unenlightened. Religions are man-made. The really great souls who came to show us the way to the true light did not found or even mention the founding of religions. Nor did they ever say that spirituality and morality should ever be forced on people by coercion, which leads to rebellion and dissent. It is said in the Secret Doctrine, volume two, page 516, the whole essence of truth cannot be transmitted from mouth to ear, nor can any pen describe it, not even that of the recording angel, unless man finds the answer in the sanctuary of his own heart, in the innermost depths of his divine intuitions. And that's worth repeating. The whole essence of truth cannot be transmitted from mouth to ear, nor can any pen describe it, not even that of the recording angel, unless man finds the answer in the sanctuary of his own heart, in the innermost depths of his or her divine 
intuitions. If we are able to get beyond the clouds, we see the sun. The seeming complexity and intellectuality of the secret doctrine is a kind of blind in itself. If we have developed our intuitions to any degree, we see another dimension of teachings growing behind the mask. But the study itself is helping us to develop these intuitions. It's just that we have to be aware of the ability in us to move on, to keep the mind open, to let the light stream in gradually and not become stranded on some sandbank of thought. We have to go through the words and ideas we formulate ever onwards and upwards until we transcend the binding power of words and images and enter the world of no form, of which all forms are but narrowed reflections, as HPB once, once said. Again, to go back to the secret doctrine, page, uh, one, page two. Can the flame be called the essence of fire? This essence is the life and light of the universe. The visible fire and flame are destruction, death and evil. Fire and flame destroy the body of an Arat. Their essence makes him immortal. The essence of, of the flame, of fire, flame makes, him, makes him as immortal. And that's from the Bodhi Mur book two. This brings to light a lot, of what, a lot of what we said regarding the phoenix. The divine light is the essence of what on earth manifests as fire. And though the visible fire and flame may destroy the physical, the essence is what enables us to become divine beings and rise from the seemingly destructive properties of heat and fire. This divine light is referred to in the secret doctrine as cold flame, cold flame. It is the essence and also our true nature when all the lore has been burned away. What causes this fire that burns away all the dross is the friction in our lives. All those happen, things that happen that force us to go within to find the strength to continue. Like I, when I was, well, I mentioned earlier about when I was in hospital. All the hardships that test our belief in the power of the divine, that strips away all else but the, that faith that comes from our studies and meditations. There comes a time when all that we have gathered from books and lectures, etc., cannot help us. There must be that leap of faith when we discover the reality of all that we have intellectually le learned previously. It will come for all of us in the course of time. It has to be so that we can blossom into what we truly are. It has to become real. The distance between what we, we intellectually understand and its reality in our lives has to be bridged. Otherwise we will struggle and, we'll be, and, be, and maybe st st uh, stranded on, on a sandbank of our own making. It's important not to create a barrier between the words we read and the experience of our day-to-day -day lives. If we do study and the words become a kind of escape from reality into a world we, we imagine to be separate and different than the one we live in, we become lost in the divisiveness of what we imagine and what we actually are experiencing. So our studies may fall into the dead letter that kills and HPB constantly warned us against that. In a letter to the American Convention in 1888, she wrote, orthodoxy in theosophy is a thing neither possible nor desirable. It is diversity of opinion within certain limits that keeps the theosophical society a living and a healthy body. <clears throat> it's many other ugly features notwithstanding. Were it not also for the existence of a large amount of uncertainty in the minds of students of theosophy, such healthy, healthy divergences would be impossible and the society would degenerate into a sect in which a narrow and stereotyped creed would take the place of the living and breathing spirit of truth and an ever-growing knowledge. Ever-growing knowledge. <clears throat> so it is against the principles of theosophy as laid down by HPB and the masters to form any kind of orthodox teaching of theosophy to regenerate ourselves spiritually, we need to learn how to extract the essence of what is being taught, to understand that often the words are often masking what is true, and that we need to develop an intuitive awareness of what the symbology of the words means. Now the voice of the silence says, out of the furnace of man's life and its black smoke, winged flames arise, flames purified that soaring onward neath the kermic eye, weave in the end the fabric glorified of the three vestures of the path. I won't go into the three vestures now, we don't really much time, but it's just the idea of this black smoke and the winged flames. So our trials and tribulations should make our hearts, eyes and our hearts mild and tender, 
like those of the phoenix. And through all our suffering and pain, something beautiful beyond words arises. The alchemy of our whole being into something which words can never and will never encompass. Liu Yiming, in his book, Awakening to the Tao, mentions the process of, of Taoist alchemy and writes of setting up the cauldron and stabilizing the furnace. He says, when the cauldron and furnace are stabilized properly, you burn away the acquired habits that, that have become compulsive over the course of personal history, thus bringing to light the original state of completeness, slowing off all acquired pollutants. Again, it's saying the very similar thing. This, of course, is the task of true al alchemy, changing our leaden lives, well, most of our lives are leaden, no miners, <laughs> into an existence of pure gold. In a pure gold. And the voice of the silence again states, as regards a very high level of meditation, thyself and mind like twins upon a line, the star which is thy goal burns overhead. The three that dwell in glory and in bliss ineffable, now in the world of Maya, have lost their names. They have become one star, the fire that burns but scorches not. That fire which is the opadi, or the basis of the flame. The fire that burns, not, not, but scorches not, as we mentioned earlier about the, the cold flame. At the level we are at now, the fires of life, uh, of lust, anger, greed, etc., burn us but also purify us so that we can be burned by the cold flame of our spiritual nature that still burns but does not scorch. Which is like the parable of the burning house in the Lotus Sutra. And this parable is about a, 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 a king who had a, a, a large house which was falling into disrepair. And one day the house caught a fire while his children were inside. He tried desperately to get his children out of, out of the house. He kept saying, come on children, come on children, the house is burning. But they were so taken up playing with their toys that they completely um, ignored him. So eventually he said, he has to think of a way of getting them out of the house. So he, he said, well, come out of the house children, I've got better toys for you out here, outside, better toys. Um, if you come out, I'll give you bullock carts, the diamonds and gold. And so after he said that, they actually came out of the house. Um, which means that we can become so absorbed in our lives that though, though we've got the fires of old age, um, illness, etc., burning around us, lust, anger, greed, we're so absorbed in our lives that we don't pay attention to, to more spiritual things. Um, there's a lot more to it, but I won't go, again, I won't go into that because of time. So we're establishing that the friction of our lives brings about the fire in which we arise purified and inspired and enlightened by a much higher fire that is our Lord, our witness, our resting place, our asylum and our friend, if we are but willing to accept that friendship. And sadly, pain often teaches more than pleasure. It's a sad fact. If we are in a painful place, we sometimes reach an area where we either sink or we swim. This is the testing ground of our lives. Hopefully we emerge spiritually ri richer for the experience. But sometimes you get to a point where you, your back's against the wall and you can't rely on books or, or platitudes or whatever. You have to rely on something within to save you. And that's when things become real. That's when the spiritual path becomes real. There's only one place that truth can be found, and that is within. To quote, a, to, I'm going to repeat a quote I used earlier now, for a third time. The whole essence of truth cannot be transmitted from mouth to ear, nor can any pen describe it, not even that of the recording angel, unless man finds the answers in the sanctuary of his own heart, in the innermost depths of his divine intuitions. That's where we find the truth. The theosophical teachings that the masters have said that most, if not all of their teachings are incommunicable in the normal ways, unless one has reached a certain level. Though we do have the pointers in the secret doctrine and other works, but we must not think that because we have grasped the intellectual teachings of theosophy, that we thereby understand what theosophy is really all about. 
you know, just grasping the intellectual teachings means absolutely zilch in, 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 in the final analysis. <laughs> they're important. I'm not saying they're not important. I'm not degrading, you know, putting them down or anything, but we have to have something else. There has to be something else. So it's out of these experiences, these painful experiences, that we get intimations of our immortality, as, as words would said, intimations of our immortality. It's experiencing. I always another thing I always I use in a lot of talks is the the, the story of the, the strawberry. Un unless you put the strawberry in your mouth, you cannot understand the taste of the strawberry. You can go to strawberry lectures. You can read books about strawberries. You can you can go to uh, what you can you can do whatever you want. You can but until you put the strawberry in your mouth, you won't know what a strawberry tastes like. Exactly the same with spiritual experiences. Until you experience them, you won't know what they are. You'll just be, it'll just be secondary. So we start to look at life differently when, when we take the spiritual path. And we sometimes we look at the, 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 things, the opposite of the man in the street. So we know about karma, so we don't seek an eye for an eye, revenge, that is so predominant in the world today, on a personal level and a global level. We don't have the YOLO attitude of modern youth. You know what YOLO is? You only live once. And it's a very, a very predominant thing amongst young people on these social networks. YOLO, you only live once, so that gives a, an excuse for living a hedonistic lifestyle in some cases. Um, and we know about reincarnation, so we take a more relaxed attitude, as long as we don't go the other way, of course, and, uh, and become too complacent. So we seek the middle way. We're also aware that even reincarnation and karma disappear when we transcend the cycle of birth and death, um, on a very high level, of course. HPB says that living this kind of life takes us out of the calculation of the ranks of the living altogether. People in general cannot understand why someone will take the attitude of love your enemies, bless those that curse you, pray for those that despitefully use you, that you may be sons of your father or your divine, uh, divine life. Why someone would say that hatred does not cease by hatred, hatred ceases only by love. And this is the eternal law, that's what the Buddha says. Know why someone may be sympathetic with some of the most hated figures or groups in society, because they may be, understand that there may be reasons uh, that we do not know of that brought them to where they are, and that we may be in the same place, or have been in the same place in previous lives. We have trodden the same path to gain experience and understanding of the darker side. And also, if someone's a hated figure, if we send them thoughts of hatred, we're only increasing the hatred in them. How can, how can you end uh, hatred by, by giving more hatred or more? It's impossible. The only way that you can end hatred is to send love to that person. And hopefully that love will overcome the hatred in them. HPB again says that a true theosophist will never lose faith in human nature. For as I've said, the race of man is divine. So to the, to the man in the street, our attitude will be incomprehensible. If someone does something wrong, they must be punished is the accepted way to think. But how could, that can improve someone, like I've said. And as I said earlier, if we take this attitude of love your enemies, in modern society, we may be regarded as being insane. And isn't that strange that people should regard loving someone as being insane? The, the Master KH says in the Mahatma Letters to AP Sinat, Letter 8, it is the business of magic to humanize our natures with compassion. For the whole mankind as, as living beings, instead of concentrating and limiting our affections to one predilected race. Yet few of us, except such as have attained the final negation of moksha, or in enlightenment, can so enfranchise ourselves from the influence of our earthly connections as to be insusceptible in various degrees to the higher pleasures, emotions and interests of the common run of humanity. Until final emancipation reabsorbs the ego, he must be conscious of the purest sympathies 
called out by the aesthetic effects of high art, its tenderest chords respond to the call of the holier and nobler human attachments. Of course, the greater the progress towards deliverance, the less will this be the case, until to crown all human and purely individual personal feelings, blood ties and friendship, patriotism and race predilection, all will give way to become blended into one universal feeling, the one true and holy, the only unselfish and eternal one love, an immense love for humanity as a whole. For it is humanity which is the great orphan, the only disinherited one upon this earth, my, my friend. And it is the duty of every man who is capable of an unselfish impulse to do something, however little, for its welfare. Very beautiful. And from the light on the path, do not fancy you can stand aside from the bad man or the foolish man. They are yourself, though in a less degree than your friend or your master. But if you allow the idea of separateness from any evil thing or person to grow up within you, by doing so you create karma, which will bind you to that thing or person till your soul recognises that it cannot be isolated. Remember that the sin and shame of the world are your sin and shame. For you are part of it. Your karma is inextricably interwoven with the great karma. And before you can attain knowledge, you must have passed through all places, foul and clean alike. That's very important. You must have passed through all places, foul and clean alike. Therefore, remember that the soiled garment you shrink from touching may have been yours yesterday, may be yours tomorrow. And if you turn with horror from it, when it is flung upon your shoulders, it will cling more closely to you. The self-righteous man makes for himself a bed of mire. Abstain because it is right to abstain, not that your, yourself shall be kept clean. Abstain because it is right to abstain, not that yourself shall be kept clean. So that's why we never judge others and not, do not go blind, blindly along with public opinion, but try to see the divine in others. And know that there is, even people we regard as bad, there is some, there's goodness. I think HPB once said that she believed that everyone would respond to words of kindness and of love. Maybe there are people so evil that the spirit is lost forever, but they are too rare to mention, and most people will respond at some level to, 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 to kindness and compassion and love. The most important thing to remember is that we are not separate from others. We all share the same spirit. All existence is just one thing. It is this great dire heresy of separateness that, that weans us from the rest, that is the cause of so much mischief in the world today. It is important, well essential really, to see beyond the mask of the personality and try to see through it th to the real person. Because the personality means the persona is a mask, isn't it? So whoever devised that word, must have, the Greeks must have known that it was masking something. Another negative view that we have nowadays is that if a person normally, do, does some, uh, normally good does something bad, then people say, his true colours are showing now, <laughs> but uh, and this is another symptom of the mistake of a mistaken society, because a person's true colours are always the divinity within. So when, when a person does something that's bad, it's his false colours that are showing, not his true colours. It's another way, like the eye for an eye thing. It's another negative way of looking of looking at things. So I'll never lose faith in human nature. There is so much beauty in life, in nature, and in our fellow human beings, if only we look for it. We have to look through a veil, the veil though created by the media and our materialistic education system and government policies and by pessimistic scientific views of nature. These are the fires that rage around us and from which we must emerge purified by the higher flames of our spiritual self. We have to learn to see the world as it is, not how we are trained to see it, or co coerced in some ways. It's a case of seeing with our spiritual eye. It's not a great mystical awakening, but just a return to what we truly are, beyond all the masks that we were. Light is always our guide. And I remember a story told about a young man who went blind. And he, he, told, he said that whenever he did something that was right and good, he felt a light within him. 
go brighter and brighter. Whenever he did something wrong, the light dimmed. And that became his guide. It'd be his guide, literally. We too can feel an increase of lightness if we do something spiritual, and a heaviness of heart if we do something against our true nature. This may seem like a different use of the word light, but it is the feeling of this inner illumination that makes us feel lighter in all ways. The path of spiritual regeneration is open to us all. Let's not ever think it is something in the future. This is a trick of Maya. As Banke says, our task is not to become Buddhas. Banke was a Zen master, by the way. <clears throat> not to become Buddhas, but to remain Buddhas. Not to become Buddhas, but to remain Buddhas. We are already there, we just have to waken up. But of course our studies and meditations are a process of awakening. And it is up to the sincerity of the individual how quickly they can awaken to remember who or what they are <coughs> in its essence. <coughs> Our theosophical books are there to help us to wake up. We learn about humanity's past and its future and its present place in the scheme of things, but only so we can become aware of what lies beyond all the changes because what we are in reality can never be encompassed by words or by thoughts. It is something genuine that we must in time become and live. It is to this divinity that we give obeisance and we constantly strive to see it in others, to look at our fellow travelers, our tra fellow pilgrims upon this planet in a different light, as divine beings struggling, to, struggling as we are along the path, as fellow pilgrims. So we should, never be, we should always be prepared to help rather than condemn, because we ourselves may have been down that road ourselves in past lives, or in future ones, as said. Again, remember that the Bodhisattva never despised, who looked at people and said, I can never despise you, you'll all be Buddhas someday. So let's try to emulate that attitude in our daily lives and try to see the divine in all so that we shall rise like phoenix fr phoenixes from the flames of misunderstandings to see humanity as it is, with all its potential and its spiritual beauty. And may any benefit accrued from this talk help to reduce the total, uh, sum total of suffering in the world and help to bring about peace and, on earth and goodwill to all beings, because it, this is what it really needs at the moment. Thank you.